This story ended up being much longer than I originally anticipated, and I apologize for the long read. I will say, in all the years I've told this story, people usually respond this way. That is the craziest thing I've ever heard, so I hope you take the time and enjoy it as well. This occurred in the summer of 2008. I grew up in Oregon and was acquainted with the outdoors at an early age. My favorite hobby came to be hiking, particularly in the areas that are either very dangerous or isolated. The health benefits of hiking were secondary to the thrills of walking the edges of exposed cliffs, being in cougar and bear territory, and knowing that I was far from help. Into the Wild was released in the fall of 2007. I immediately fell in love. Being a high school senior, I could barely go another week living in my parents' house. The movie spoke to my sense of adventure and inspired me to hike the California portion of the Pacific Crest Trail upon graduation. I made it from the Mexico border to Northern California without any incident. I saw a few rattlesnakes and black bears, experienced a little dehydration, but nothing that made me fear for my life. Somewhere in the Lassen National Forest in Northeastern California, I walked around a bend in the trail, only to be startled by two people sitting on a rock, dressed in nearly all white. Their faces were dirty, their appearance disheveled, and the man had a long, unkempt beard. Both seemed to be in their 40s. They looked like the couple who kidnapped Elizabeth Smart. What struck me as odd about the encounter was encountering anybody at all. I frequently went days without seeing a single human being. Their white clothes could be explained away by the need to escape the California summer sun. Their scruffy appearance could be explained away by the fact that most through hikers abandon personal hygiene on the trail. After I say hello, they say nothing, just simply watch me as I passed. Even that I didn't find odd, I just chalked it up to them being foreign and not knowing what to say to me. I camped a few hundred yards off the trail that night, as I always did. Following bear precautions, I hung the leftover food I had cooked that night from a tree approximately five feet off the ground. Packing up camp in the morning, I noticed that food was no longer there. I immediately thought a bear had entered my campsite, so I began to look for paw prints. I didn't find paw prints, but I did find boot prints circling my campsite. Two pairs of them. One of those prints led right up to the rope which the food was hanging from. I immediately thought of the couple that I passed earlier, and everything clicked. I quickly packed up and left. My mind was racing the entire day. I figured maybe that couple was just simply hungry. If they had any nefarious intentions, they would have come for more than just the food, right? Several days passed. My mind was at ease again. I would begun to circle my campsite with sticks to wake me in the event of an intruder, animal or otherwise. I woke in my tent one night to the sound of those sticks crunching. I grabbed my hunting knife. I tried to relax by telling myself that in the middle of nowhere, the source of that noise could be much more likely an animal than a person. Then I hear frantic whispering. It was impossible to tell which direction the voices were coming from. Being in the dark surrounded by trees, a hundred miles from the nearest city, play some tricks on your senses. I debated on yelling out, claiming to have a gun, but instead decided to stay silent and retain the benefit of surprise. I heard footsteps circling my tent. I was ready to slash whatever opened it. But just like that, it was over. No more footsteps, no more whispering. I lied frozen awake in my tent until sunrise and then opened my tent to find nobody. The only evidence that something had actually happened were boot prints same as the night before. Several more days passed. I was now in Shasta National Forest, probably 50 to 75 miles from where I first encountered the couple. The trail became more or less a goat trail, being on the side of a mountain and above the tree line. I could see the trail winding for miles in front of and behind me. I stopped for water in the rare shade and noticed two hikers miles behind me. All I could see were two white dots moving along the mountainside and I immediately said aloud to myself, Fuck this. This trip is over. I pulled out my map and looked for the nearest town, which appeared to be Costella, located off I-5. 
The only problem was, it was 25 miles away. I hiked well into the night, trying to gain as much ground as possible. I kept losing the trail and decided to just set up camp, this time far off the trail and into the forest. I got in my tent, tried to sleep, but every little noise kept me wide awake. After a few hours in my tent, I heard the telltale signs of another bad night. The footsteps, the whispering, the sticks breaking. Sound travels far in the absence of any other sound. I knew that they were close, but wasn't sure how close. All I could think was this is really messed up. This is so messed up. Finally, a flashlight hits my tent, lights up the entire thing, then goes dark. I unzip my tent, climbed out carrying my knife, yelling nonsense into the dark. It was sort of like that cliche scene in movies where people are in the wilderness. They hear sticks breaking around them and the camera pans around the trees because the people have no idea which direction the sound was actually coming from. Then I heard footsteps running toward the tent. I barely made out a figure moving in my peripheral vision. I just turned and ran deep into the forest. I tripped several times and ran into several trees. After running for approximately five minutes, I tripped rolled and came to rest next to a downed tree. I got under the tree trunk and laid completely still. I saw the flashlight moving around in the distance. I laid under that tree for hours and hours. I was certain they were gone, but I still didn't move. Eventually birds started chirping. I knew sunrise would come soon. Once it did, I made my way back to the trail, abandoned my campsite, and walked the rest of the distance to Castella, where the Pacific Crest Trail crosses I-5. I hitchhiked my way to the town of Mount Shasta, spoke with the police and forest service. They put me up in a motel for the night, and my parents drove from Oregon to pick me up the next day. I followed up with the police and forest service months later, who told me there had been similar reports of items disappearing from campsites throughout the surrounding national forest. However, there had been no other reports of terrorizing that I experienced. And as far as I know, nothing else ever came of that couple. A few years back, my girlfriend and I, having hiked several other parts of the Appalachian Trail, decided we wanted to give the southern portion of Virginia Trail a shot. It is about 166 miles long and runs through George Washington and Jefferson National Forests from Roanoke County to Parisburg and Giles County. This is definitely one of the more remote and less traveled parts of the trail, which is exactly what we were looking for. We gathered our gear and made our way to the start of the Virginia Creeper Trail to begin our journey. We had planned our journey to end at Damascus and figured that by that time when we got there, we would be more than ready to go home to our own beds. It was early October. The changing of the leaves and the colors were amazing. The air was crisp and cool. Perfect hiking weather with beautiful scenery. The majority of the trip was pretty uneventful. Just your typical hike. But our last couple of nights, that's where things got weird. On this portion of the trail, you're supposed to camp on the trail or designated shelter. We didn't really want to run into other people and didn't want anyone coming up on us in the middle of the night, so we decided to ignore those suggestions, find our own little spot right off the trail. So a little searching around and we find a spot just a little ways off the trail in the middle of this small clearing. It was perfect. We set up camp, cooked some food, then talked for a while, all to end up snuggled up and went to sleep for the night. Somewhere around 2am, I was awoke by my girlfriend shaking me, telling me, Get your gun. Someone's outside walking around our tent. She informed me that she woke up to what sounded like someone right outside the tent, running a knife or something along the side, all while just circling us. While hiking, I carry a 1911 and a judge. You never know exactly who or what you might run into on such a long hike, especially in a remote location. I got the judge out of my pack, and we sat silently listening for any more sounds. A few minutes and nothing, but just the breeze blowing through the trees. Then I heard it. A snap, crunch, snap. Someone, or something, 
was walking in the woods right behind our tent. I got the flashlight and silently made my way out. Our fire had completely gone out, so it was nearly pitch black. Illuminated by only the dim glow of the October moon, I told my girlfriend to stay put while I checked it out. I didn't flick the flashlight on right away, so as to not give myself away that I was out of the tent and have it become a shining beacon of my location. Instead, I waited to hear more of those noises. After a few minutes, snap, crunch, crack. It sounded like it was bipedal, based on the way the steps were paced. I turned on the flashlight and flooded the area with light. I thought I saw someone move behind a tree. I yelled out to them, told them to go away now, and that I was armed. I kept the light on the area with my gun drawn, and slowly approached towards the area where I thought I saw that figure. Then, from my right, I hear what sounds like someone running away through the woods. I spin and face my light that way. Then from the original spot, who or whatever was, takes off into the woods. There's no way I was given chase, so I just return back to the campsite. I tell my girlfriend all about what happened, and I end up sitting guard outside the tent, in the darkness, until daybreak. The next morning, I look around for bits or signs of who or whatever that was. I discovered a boot print and some moist dirt, not far off from our tent. Definitely wasn't mine or my girl's. This freaked me out, as it definitely confirmed that someone, perhaps more than one, was skulking around our tent after dark. I kept it to myself because I didn't want to freak my girl out any more than she already was. So at this point, we were pretty deep in and still had two days left. That day, we walked a little faster than normal, covering as much ground as we possibly could. When it came time to set up camp, I found a spot near a cliff where we could place the tent in a small overhang and prevent anyone from coming up behind us. The whole day up until this point, I had a feeling that we were being followed. I had no confirmation of this, I hadn't seen or heard anyone, but it was just a gut feeling. We set up camp, made some food, then retreated back into the tent. I gave my girl the 1911, I kept the judge right next to me and assured her that if I slept at all, it would be with one eye open. After a while, she drifted off to sleep. I stayed awake listening to the sounds of the woods at night. I was awake for a few hours, just waiting to see if anything was actually going to happen. At some point, I guess my exhaustion caught up with me. I drifted off. I awoke sometime later, what sounded like someone going through our stuff outside of our tent. I grabbed my gun and woke up my girlfriend, shushing her telling her to be quiet. From the faint glow of the fire, I could see someone's silhouette against the tent. There really was someone out there this time. I yelled out to them something along the lines of, Hey, we are armed. Get the f*** out of here. They dropped what they were doing and just bolted. I came out of the tent, gun drawn and ready to shoot. All of our stuff was strewn all about. They had rummaged through quite a bit of it. I walked to the edge of the woods, in the direction whoever was out there had fled. There was a creek nearby. I walked to the edge where I thought there was a small trail running along the side of it. Down the creek, I could see a light. It looked like a lantern the way it flickered. Then, I saw three more emerge from the other side of the woods. I told my girlfriend to start packing up whatever she could and that we were leaving right now. We packed up everything of value, left the tent and a few other items and headed back onto the trail in the middle of the night. I kept hearing people talking off in the woods, hearing branches snap for quite some time. I kept looking back behind us every few seconds to make sure that no one was coming up on us. It was completely nerve wracking. If something happened, we were still a long ways from anywhere and quite literally on our own. We hadn't seen another hiker the entire time we'd been out there. I really felt like we were both in some serious danger. We'd been walking for quite some time when I heard something in the woods behind us. As we rounded a corner, I turned around and saw someone step out onto the trail and just stand there watching. It was just as the sun was coming up, barely any light. I couldn't make out any features, just silhouette. I stopped, looked at them for a second, 
and asked them who they were and what they wanted. They stood there, silently, watching, then turned and walked back into the woods. We picked up the pace and just kept going, looking back ever so often. We didn't see them again though, but again my gut told me that they were still there. Eventually we reached the trail and got to where we had parked my girlfriend's car, both extremely exhausted. We made it out of the Virginia woods without becoming a meal for the clan of cannibalistic inbred hillbillies, which is what I pictured happening in my head that whole time. I have no idea who they were, what they wanted. Maybe it was just someone messing with us. Maybe it really was a clan of deformed hillbillies who were hunting us. I'll never know because, well, for obvious reasons, I won't be returning to find out. This is a story that my father has told me multiple times. My dad, he's a logger, specifically one who operates a tree saw, which is basically a giant machine that is capable of cutting down massive trees and cutting them to specified lengths, which means he spends a lot of time alone in the deep forest. The way my dad's logging crew was set up is he would be told where he was supposed to cut down trees and he would go do that and be paid based on the amount of trees he cut down not how long it took him. So my dad used to work 16 to 20 hour days, constantly to get done as quick as possible. Then the rest of the crew would come up and clean the trees and ship them up to the mill. He would work 50% of the time all alone. The rest was with another tree saw operator named Rennie. They would use radios to communicate back and forth when they were working together. This is relevant for down the line in the story. So my dad and Rennie were put on a new job site and were 10 days in Everything was going as planned. They were constantly hearing weird chitter chatter over the radio, and it was such poor quality. No words could be heard or whatever radio channel they changed it to. It seemed to follow them. As they progressed through the job and went further up the mountains, those words from the radio would slowly become more audible. Both of them agreed based on small parts of the conversation that they could hear that something was wrong. They also began finding weird containers all over the place and signs that people had been there. People should not have been there. This was a two and a half hour drive up the mountain. They had to spend three weeks clearing out the road so their trucks and equipment could make it there. They come to the conclusion and the realization that they are in a very secluded area with people who shouldn't be there. And the worst part was, they aren't scheduled to leave for another week or so. They would only leave to refuel the truck with gasoline for the machines. They would buy supplies and sleep in campers. One day, Rennie comes across a tent and calls my dad over. They investigate that tent and find one lone sleeping bag with a duffel bag. Inside the duffel bag, they find many pairs of children's underwear, as well as a rope and duct tape, and sketched images of children being... and photographs of children who appear to be unaware that they're being photographed. Inside that tent, they also find a small amount of food. They also found a small amount of food which included canned goods and an apple, which proved that the tent had been occupied recently because there was no mold on that apple. Again, they are now on the mountain alone with, best case scenario, just a really messed up individual. Rennie instantly wants to get out, but my dad being the hardest working person ever, insists they would just need to finish the job and then they can leave. So they decide they will not talk over the radios unless it's an emergency and then see if they can hear something else going on. They are now close enough in range of whoever has been talking to hear conversations between two men about collecting water and wood for the fire. Nothing abnormal, except for the fact that these guys don't belong here, and that tent was undoubtedly theirs. At the end of one of the work days, my dad hears them on the radio again, talking about one of them collecting brush for a fire. My dad hops on the radio, attempts to communicate with them, about what they're doing. I believe he said, Who are you and what are you doing here? After this conversation, the men abruptly stopped and never picked back up again. That same night, Rennie wakes my dad up and whispers for him to get his gun. Someone's outside. So my dad has told me, the first thing that he hears when he woke up 
is the quiet shuffling of feet outside. My dad fumbled for his gun. He finally found it, but realizes that he didn't even have it loaded and has next to little no clue where his rounds are located. Rennie has nothing, and the thought of calling the police is absurd for multiple reasons. They hear a jiggle on the doorknob, and it opens. The camper itself is far enough to the ground, to where you had to jump in, and there's no ladder or footstool. The door stays open. Neither my dad nor Rennie moved. They hear scratching right outside the door, though. After four minutes of the scratching, my dad can no longer take it and just nods at Rennie. He gets up quietly, walks towards the camper door. The second he reaches it, he is met with intense pain right across his right eye all the way to his left cheek. He's been cut and falls out of the camper hitting the ground hard. A man with a knife gets on top of him and is soon being kicked in the head by a man behind him as well. Rennie leaps out of the trailer and manages to get the man off my dad. My dad gets up and realizes that that second man without the knife is now running away, and the man with the knife is scrambling away from Rennie and starts running alongside his accomplice. My dad and Rennie get into the truck and drive to the nearest hospital to treat my dad's cut and later report the events to the police. They both quit their jobs and two weeks later, as the rest of the logging crew was finishing up that job, one of them was found gagged, bound, murdered and thrown into a ditch. As far as my dad's aware, no one was ever convicted of those crimes. To this day, my dad can still hardly see out of his right eye, and the pupil is disfigured and looks more like a cat's eye than a human. He suffers from massive PCSD from these events, hasn't slept a good night of sleep ever since. I'm a 33-year-old female from Los Angeles. Three years ago, my boyfriend and I, as planned for five years, turned 30, sold everything we owned, including my car, took his trailblazer, and decided to travel around the States and Canada. I guess you could call us backpackers, as we tend to chase good weather, find a state park and backcountry hike into the wilderness for days at a time. My brother likes to joke that we are anti-establishment hippies. We don't necessarily live off the grid, but between the two of us, we have one prepaid phone that we use for emergencies and checking in with family and friends, and one MacBook, which I use for work. I'm a freelance writer, content creator, and I'm on retainer with Robotics Company. I mostly write boring white papers or web content. The whole point of our living situation is to live debt-free and to have as few bills as possible. I only use free Wi-Fi. So one to two times a week, we would go to a city with Starbucks. The background information is only important so you know who we are and how we simply live. Neither of us are involved in social media. We know very little of Reddit, Instagram, or use any other apps. So last summer, we decided to do some backcountry hiking in Arkansas. It's one of those states you don't really ever hear about other hikers visiting, but we read that it had some beautiful natural landscape. It does. The rules at this particular park were pretty lax. We didn't need a permit. There were few basic laws and guidelines, but there were no check-ins needed. We had all the basics and planned to do a six-day hike. Three in, three out. The whole time we were out there, we didn't see or hear another soul. But then one day, we were prepping to move off the trail, find a camping spot as it's getting near dusk. Half a mile off the trail is usually the standard for us. We took what looked like almost kind of like an animal trail, about a half a mile out. We saw this green two-person tent. It was almost camouflaged in the foliage, so we came on it, almost by accident. Some backpackers prefer privacy, others are more social. We are the more social type. We've had some great experiences camping near other backpackers, sharing stories, food in a joint or two. We were around 30 yards away from the tent. It was zip closed. So my boyfriend shouted a greeting to make our presence known. No movement, no sound. We assumed green tent guy was either not around or didn't want to be bothered. So we just started off in a new direction to get them distance between us. We camped, never heard a beep. 
We move along the next morning, completely forgetting about Green Tent Guy, until nearing the end of day five on our trek back. We were again looking for a spot to camp off the trail when we came upon that green tent again. This isn't that unusual, but normally, backcountry hikers keep moving, so we really weren't expecting to come upon it again. This time, however, the tent flap was open, so my boyfriend yells his greeting again. Nothing. My boyfriend wants to go check it out, saying, this is weird. Maybe someone's hurt. I didn't really like the idea from the get-go because even though we hadn't had any bad experiences personally, we heard enough stories from other backpackers about hermits and mountain men that want privacy, they carry guns, etc. My boyfriend assured me we'd be fine. If all else fails, offer him some weed and just keep the peace and we go on our way. As soon as we get within 20 yards of the place, we could smell the decomposition and it's intense. My boyfriend has been hailing his greeting over the last 20 yards. Once the smell hits him, he stops, turns to me, and says, What if we find a dead body? My skin crawled. I was immediately afraid. I've never seen a dead body before, and don't want to. The closer we got to the tent, the worse the smell got. I knew for sure we are going to walk in and see some old camper's rotting corpse. What we found was, well, worse. Outside the tent was a dead doe's legs, all four of them, covered in flies. It looked like the legs had been cut most of the way, then ripped off the rest. It was a mess. Inside the tent, the body and the head of the deer. But the middle portion was swaddled in a blue fleece blanket. Blood was soaked at the bottom where the legs used to be. It was laying on its side, bottom facing the tent entry. The tail had been cut off. The anus and vagina was covered in dried blood and a gape. Like something had been penetrating it. Same with its mouth. The bottom portion was bent down at a scary broken looking angle. The tent was open, so we could see everything without actually having to go inside. Not that we would have anyway, because at this point, the smell was almost debilitating. There's a dirty, almost empty clear bottle of Jurgen's baby oil and a stained green white fringe kitchen towel. That was it. I immediately start crying and begged him to leave. All he could muster out was, what the f***? We turned and ran. We ran to the trail and jogged down it for as far as we could go until dusk was fully upon us and we had to set up camp. We didn't go very far and neither of us slept. We didn't start a fire or use headlamps even after full dark. We just sat up whispering to one another, going over and over what we had just seen. Every small or little noise startled us. Our brains were on red alert. I kept thinking any moment this weird creepy dead deer rapist would come back to his tent, see our footprints or something, know we were there, and then track us back to ours. I've never been so scared in my entire life. Just before dawn, we tore down and started back out onto the trail. My boyfriend stopped at the ranger station on our way out of the park to report what we'd found. The ranger was a young guy around our age, and he looked very freaked out by our story as we were telling it to him. He wrote it down. My boyfriend showed him on a map approximately where we'd been. He asked if we knew how the deer was killed, and at that point, we hadn't even thought about it. We just assumed it had been shot, but because of that blanket, we never saw a wound. But we weren't really exactly giving it an autopsy either. We have since shortened our backcountry hikes to a maximum of four days. We also have been a lot less eager to call out to other campsites. And we've never approached another unmanned tent since. The summer of 2008 was a rough time to graduate from college. I had just spent four years getting a degree, only to find that the job market had all but dried up 
As bummed out as I was about being unemployed for the foreseeable future, I found a deep appreciation for backcountry camping and hiking that summer. Growing up in the Rocky Mountains and graduating from college in western Montana, I was not a stranger to hiking or camping. But that summer, it became an escape to the point of an obsession. Going on daily hikes and camping beneath the stars really helped my mental health while I worried about my life's purpose and my future. It was June, and unseasonably cold, wet, and cloudy. The daytime highs barely touched 50 degrees, and at night, it dropped below freezing. Despite the weather, I had planned to hike around the Anaconda Range that week, and I wasn't going to let that deter me. My plan for the week, funny enough, was to hike from Storm Lake, over to Storm Lake Pass, and down to Upper Seymour Lake. Storm Lake is a challenge to get to and requires a 4x4 pickup and some skilled driving. The road is a narrow two-track winding its way through thick pine forest. The way was slick with rain, but I made it to the top with little heartburn. I set up camp on the north shore of the lake and decided to do some fishing. The fishing was miserable. It was cold and nothing was biting. The best thing about bad fishing is that my thoughts were free to wander while I sat on the shore. The rain was a constant light drizzle and created a natural white noise. Time passed and my daydreams were cut short as a low rumble from up the canyon overtook the sounds of the rain. The rumbling was not unlike a distant diesel engine. There are no roads that go beyond where I camped. No machinery or vehicles could be up that canyon. Maybe it's a plane, I thought, looking up into the rain clouds. But that sound wasn't getting closer or further away, and the sound wasn't really above me. It came from beyond the lake and up into the canyon. The sound was stationary and constant. This was most certainly not a plane or a truck or even a bulldozer. All of this wasn't outright scary, but nonetheless my hair stood on end while I sat there just listening. After 20 minutes the rumbling faded away, and I was left again with the only sound of raindrops. Soon enough, I caught a decent sized trout and cleaned it, then headed back to camp to get ready for dinner. The fish cooked up fine, but to be honest, I hate trout. It's edible, sure, but totally unappetizing. They taste like mud. I ate as much as I could stand and then tossed the rest into the lake. Building up my fire for the night, I sat back to enjoy the evening with a little bit of whiskey. Night came fast. The mountain ridges put the sun to bed early and the rain clouds obscured the starlight. It was dark, really dark. The sounds of crackling warm fire and the rain bouncing off my tent were a great comfort and started to lull me off to sleep. I reminded myself that I needed to build up the fire before bed. I walked over to my pile of scavenged firewood and grabbed an armful. Being away from the fire's crackling, I could pick up that all too familiar rumbling rising in the background. It was growing louder than before and closer. I may have had too many pulls of the whiskey and was tired and grouchy. This noise was ruining my camping trip and my buzz. Frustrated, I yelled into the blackness of the night. Hey! Shut the f*** up, asshole! Like a switch being flipped, the rumbling stopped. And so did the rain. My heart skipped a beat. I realized that was not a convenient coincidence. There is an intelligence out there, something sentient, observing me and responding to my screams, and I wasn't getting the most positive vibes from it. I threw all the logs onto the fire and then retreated back to my tent. More on edge than ever, I just sat there, listening, listening to the fire crackling, to my rapid breathing, and beyond that, to the silence of the darkness. Before this moment, I had felt alone, but safe. Now, I felt alone and vulnerable. Beyond where the firelight faded, I felt like there was a million eyes that were just watching me. My paranoia began to subside when the rain started back suddenly again. Not a drizzle, but a massive downpour. I was glad I built up the fire, or it would have been snuffed out for sure. My tent was being pushed down by the force of that storm. I thought about bailing to the truck, but knew it would only be soaked to the bone instantly. Risking injury or death over getting wet is the kind of logic only whiskey can produce. 
I could feel the rainwater pooling and moving under my tent. The storm wasn't letting up. The urge to get in my pickup and drive away was never more tantalizing. I could get my stuff tomorrow in the daylight and spend a few nights in town. But I'd had way too much to drink. Driving, especially on that slick, muddy two-track road, would have been a death sentence. But I still needed a safer place to sleep than my wimpy tent. Grabbing what I could, I ripped open the tent flap and ran for my truck. I was soaking wet by the time I settled into the driver's seat and locked my door. Turning on the heat on full blast, I hoped that would dry me out. It was going to be a miserable night though. I reclined in my chair and tried to calm my thoughts with deep breaths. The rain still wasn't letting up. I was warm from the heater and I was riding the crest of a good whiskey buzz. The fire was still raging despite the rain and kept the campsite well lit. I remember the truck's clock reading 1.06 a.m. I blinked. It was only a moment, but when I opened my eyes, the rain had stopped. It was foggy and quiet. The once raging campfire was just embers, and there was morning twilight to the east. My truck's clock now read 5.45 a.m. It was morning. That couldn't be right. Almost five hours had gone in the blink of an eye. I must have passed out. My head was killing me. I didn't feel like I drank that much to justify that kind of hangover, though. I turned off my truck and stepped out to survey the night's damage. My tent was completely flattened. The tent poles were shattered to pieces. Everything was soaking wet. Smothering the remains of the fire, I dragged all my junk to the pickup and tossed it into my bed. My hike over the pass wasn't happening today, that was for sure. It was around 6.30am before I finished picking up camp. As I climbed into the cab of my truck, I heard the rumbling again through the morning fog. I drove out of there as fast as I could, down that muddy bobsled track of a road, not once looking in the rearview mirror. I have never been back to Storm Lake, and I probably never will. Last summer, my boyfriend and I went camping in some nature preserve in Pennsylvania. I can't remember the exact name, but it was pretty primitive camping. No cell service, and we only saw two other people there the entire time. It was huge, so it was pretty empty. My boyfriend pretty much immediately said that these two people seemed off to him right away. I don't know if they had anything to do with what happened that night, but I'll describe them. The first person was a woman who had her truck parked off the trail and hood open. I really don't notice these types of things, but my boyfriend said it looked to him like she was waiting for someone to pull off beside her and offer to help her with her truck. Normally, my boyfriend is the type to at least offer to call someone, but he said that she skeeved him out enough that he didn't want to draw attention any more than what was necessary. The next person we saw drove by there several times while we were setting up. He just kept driving by slowly and looking at us. Again, I really didn't notice, but my boyfriend pointed it out to me. This guy's already drove by twice. We're not sure if these people had anything to do with what sinister happened. The real story has to do with what happened and what woke us up at 3 a.m. All of a sudden, it was incredibly loud. I couldn't really describe it or even compare it to anything, but my boyfriend said it sounded similar to a chain gun revving up or something some kind of a large tool used to scrape gravel. He jumps up looks out the little window of the tent and hears that sound happening again and again and again. Each time it was getting noticeably closer. I was about to piss myself, but my boyfriend told me it had to be probably miles off. I didn't question this because loud noises can be heard from miles off, right? Well, later my boyfriend told me that he told me that because he didn't want to scare me. What it really sounded like was it was coming from right down that little dirt road that was right next to us. At one point, he said he suspected it was right in front of our campsite. The only reason he didn't tell me to get out and dart for the car was because he was afraid it could be someone trying to scare us and get us out of the tent for some unknown reason. He whispered for me to go back to sleep. However, I couldn't because every little sound I heard outside sounded like someone sneaking up to our tent. Eventually, my boyfriend told me to get out and help him pack. It was maybe 20 minutes after that sound had stopped. He held our only weapon, a machete right in front of him. 
It's a full moon or close to it, so we didn't really need a light. While we were packing up quickly, I noticed an empty beer can, now close to our dead campfire. It wasn't there when we went to sleep around 10 p.m., and neither of us had brought any beer with us. Thankfully, we got out of there, and for the rest of that trip, we either camped in areas well populated by other campers or got a hotel room. So whoever or whatever that was, it's not me. This story is about a bad experience I had when I went camping on the beach in the summer with my boyfriend. We had the nice idea of camping on the beach instead of going to a hotel, since I've always wanted to sleep and hear the waves hitting the shore, see the night sky, and just live this experience at least once in my life. We were supposed to stay in that tent for a week. The area had public restrooms with showers and restaurants, so the matter of hygiene and hunger weren't an issue. We bought all the supplies we needed for such an adventure. A two-person tent, which was blacked out, so the sun rays wouldn't come in. An inflatable mattress, a first aid kit, lanterns for the tent, etc. The first nights, no issues. We actually enjoyed every single moment of it. We would always take all of our valuables with us into backpacks, just in case anything bad happened to our tent. We weren't the only people that camped in that area either. There were actually plenty of people that would camp there. Either single people, couples, or even families which included even people that behaved badly. When night came, you would occasionally hear people laughing, partying, dancing, listening to music, doing drugs, and drinking a lot of alcohol. We didn't really mind it. Nobody had bothered anyone for the past four days and night. People were just having fun as they knew best, and no one was being aggressive to that point. One of the nights we stayed out a little later than normal, around 1 a.m., just wandering around the lively streets to listen to the street performers, eating and such. When we stopped at one of the street performers, who seemed to have a lot of people circling him, listening to his music, we realized he wasn't the main character the people were gathered for. In the middle of the crowded street, where cars would occasionally pass by, was this middle-aged woman dancing completely naked, clearly affected by the abuse of alcohol and drugs. She was completely incoherent. She would randomly flirt with people, she would expose herself while dancing to the music, despite the disgust of the musician and the passers-by. We really didn't look or think too much into it, and decided to leave and head back to our tent, while drinking with ourselves. We hear some lady shouting in the distance. It's that same woman we'd seen earlier, but now she wasn't alone. She had a few friends with her. They were coming to camp on the same beach as us, the few tents further down, not far enough that so we couldn't hear them or see them even if it was dark. They lit a fire on the beach and continued to drink and smoke and dance around it. She, of course, was still naked, but this time, she's wearing a see-through skirt. She goes in the ocean for what seems to be an eternity, and I remember thinking, how is she not cold? That water is freezing. My boyfriend and I shrug it off, and he said just to not be bothered by it. If we don't engage with her or them, they wouldn't annoy us. So we did just that. But even so, I always felt like we were being watched. Eventually, we put those thoughts aside and tried to get some sleep. But being a beautiful night and the warm air, we thought of not completely closing the tent. Just zip over the mosquito cover so the air would circulate inside the tent and then have the sun shine in the morning to wake us up early. I don't recall how long I'd been sleeping for, but I remember being awoken by the footsteps circling our tent and a womanly voice humming a song softly. The tent was not very thick, so you could obviously hear everything outside of it. I was too afraid to look out. I was even too afraid to even change my position, as to not indicate to the outsider that I even noticed their presence. All I did was lay down and look outside through the mosquito cover. All of a sudden, I hear those footsteps stop above my head, and the voice whispering, Don't be afraid. I only want to sing you a lullaby. The footsteps began again to circle the tent. I saw her feet in front of our tent, just passing by, and noticing the very familiar, long see-through skirt blowing behind her. The next morning we packed up our tent and moved to a different area of the beach, further away from that woman and her friends. <laughs> 